Welcome to Building Effective Attack Detection in the Cloud. Uh, today presenting, you've got Nick Jones and Alfie Champion. Um, I'm Nick. I run our global cloud security team at F-Secure. Uh, when I'm not working on people's cloud security, I do attack detection, which is why I'm here. Um, and Alfie's sort of the reverse. Alfie? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I lead up the uh, global uh, attack detection service for F-Secure Consulting. Uh, and likewise, much like Nick in my spare time, I, I kind of the flip, uh, focus on, on building some, some weird and wonderful things in cloud. So first up, um, we're going to be talking about the differences between on-premise and cloud attack detection. And um, there's quite a few key differences there, I think, to focus in on. Um, secondly, what's an attacker likely to do? Um, what are they going to try in your environments? What should you be looking for? And then lastly, um, one of the things we've learned over our, our last year or two working on this is very much that there's an awful lot we can learn from the, the DevOps. Um, you know, tips and tricks, things to do that really help level up your cloud attack detection capability long term. Absolutely. So first thing to consider then is the difference when it comes to on-prem versus cloud. Is this already a solved problem? Um, can we apply the same learnings from on-premise detection that we've done for a while now um, and apply those to cloud? Well, we take a look. Um, in some ways, yes. Yes, there are some very, very obvious similarities. So you consider things like the, the automation of attacks, the scalability of those. We see this, this kind of never ending cycle of um, exploits being released and then kind of proof of concepts being released and then some, some widespread scanning and, uh, and exploitation taking place. That's still a thing. There are some kind of cloud variations of that. So you see um, exposure of credentials in things like public S3 buckets or in, inadvertently kind of pushed to, to public code repositories like GitHub. Um, and then there's also kind of a new flavor um, of attack, which is that kind of, as Maita defines it, as resource hijacking, kind of the crypto mining type stuff. Obviously, even more so, with, with there's kind of a similarity there with on-prem when it comes to ransomware being, being definitely in vogue, as it were. So there's a lot of that going on. But a lot of that, to some degree, is covered by some of the, the managed service, kind of the IDS stuff that you see from cloud providers, the likes of Guard Duty that provide things um, there relating to kind of scanning activity, to kind of beaking out to known bad IPs, that kind of thing. What we're looking at, and certainly is where we spent most of our time, kind of pushes up that 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 pyramid from the opportunistic exploitation. So um, using the instance metadata service, which has obviously been um, quite quite well known when it comes to cloud um, instance exploitation, and then moving up into that targeted attack, where it's like rather than just that indiscriminate or opportunistic, what would it look like for a sophisticated uh, attacker to target you specifically and the assets that you, you have within cloud? So that's where we, we've been focusing really. Um, when we look at this from a detective standpoint, we start looking at the telemetry. That's like the raw ingredients for detection, right? Um, On-prem, there's there's three obvious sources there. So the first is is kind of endpoint telemetry. So you you know like endpoint detection and response EDR agents are obviously hugely valuable there for for process creations and and kind of registry changes, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We've also got network telemetry, which hosts talks to each other. Things like kind of port scanning or kind of domain enumeration would end up with some some noise coming from that. And then we've also got application telemetry as well. So the way that people are interacting with potentially our, our internet facing assets, um, what telemetry does that provide? Is there any way that we can provide some kind of insight into malicious activity using that? If we now look at cloud, all of that is, is relevant, um, but we now have this, this layer above the control plane telemetry that kind of is almost encompassing everything we've just spoken about. You consider an environment um, for just a, a kind of classic on-prem application tech stack, it could be that you have the endpoint telemetry still from the operating systems hosting that stuff. It could be that you have the network telemetry of, of how those the various kind of front end and back end services interact with each other. And then you've got the application telemetry of, of the thing that you've written and you're now hosting. But now we have this, this surrounding layer, which is the control plane, where we're inter interacting with that API. So all of the, the major providers expose that API that you can use to do any number of things within the account. That could be from spinning up and, and um, virtual machines to, to provisioning um, accounts with, with new permissions, that kind of thing. So there's a whole load of, of new telemetry that we have at our disposal as defenders. Um, and there's also these three sources within that, that um, square there that are of varying importance depending on what your stack actually looks like, what you're hosting in cloud. If obviously you're not using any endpoint anymore, there's no or equivalent, there's no EC2 or virtual machines there, then obviously that doesn't really come into play anymore. And that's one of the key learnings for us is kind of where telemetry sources are applicable and where maybe they aren't anymore. 
Uh, another major finding or, or kind of experience point for us, I guess, is around context. And that comes down to when you're dealing with an environment that is purpose built, um, the actions that take place in that environment are very much based on the purpose of everything in there, every asset in there. So we consider a given kind of IAM user, for instance, in AWS. If that's upgraded, it's privileges. So it's in some, for some reason, uh, it is now kind of an admin. It can do kind of high level actions and cause a major impact. How that user obtained those privileges could be of, of huge kind of significance. Um, if that, that change is, is done by a, a CICD, continuous integration, continuous delivery user, it could be that's completely benign. That's the expected behavior, in which case we're OK with that. But the very same change made by an admin user that has no 2FA, potentially with like a, a GIP uh, enriched um, location there, you could say this is entirely odd. You know, this is completely unexpected. And in which case, this is something that we should raise and we should pursue as, as an investigation. So context is key. And all of that kind of stuff considered and kind of acknowledged, what we're facing now is, is far more complicated than that in terms of things like the interconnectivity between these services. You start dealing with tons of third party services where your crown jewels, as it were, are no longer in, in a single place in, in a data center that you can kind of point to. They're obviously hosted in, in a plethora of other services that we see there. So be that cloud providers in the traditional kind of AWS, Azure, GCP kind of sense. But that can also be um, using like Office 365 or Slack for our communications, et cetera. And the trust boundary between those um, is, is obviously a major point for us to investigate and the visibility into those various um, third party services and the log sources they provide is going to be hugely important as we go forward. So Nick, I know you've got a point on this one. Yeah, so we've had some recent experience with one client we were working with, for example, where they had a primary cloud provider that they were hosting all their applications in, but their source code was in GitHub. They were running Jenkins for their CICD. They had, uh, uh, what else, G Suite for their, um, their mail and their documents and all these kinds of things. And so we had quite a variety of different um, sort of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service um, packages that were, were in play uh, that we were ingesting logs from and that we were able to use to um, track attacker activity platform to platform. Um, you know, that worked out quite well, but it did take a bit of effort to get all of that together. Yeah. And so, you know, I think one of the, the key things that we've learned is around um, actually like how you design your cloud detection stack. Um, so first off, um, centralizing everything is pretty important. I wouldn't necessarily say we need to go for feeding all of the data into one central location particularly, but you need to make sure that it is easy for your analysts to take a look at one incidence in one thing and then pivot from that data point into other data sources in other applications, cloud providers, and um, whatever makes sense. Um, you know, one of the things we've noticed is that the harder it is for analysts to jump between um, data sources from different systems and environments, uh, the less likely they are to actively track down and investigate um, some of these things to the degree that it needs to, or it takes so long that they don't have the bandwidth to handle everything that's coming in. So very important that that is right, I think, um, that we support the analysts in generating uh, or in developing their use cases right um, and having that sort of access. Um, first up, though, um, data sources. Before we start talking about where we put this data, um, there's a couple of key data sources I think that we need to dive in on. Um, first off, you've got the control plane audit logs, and um, secondly, the, the service specific logs. So by control plane audit logs, what I mean there are CloudTrail for AWS audit log in Azure terms and, and Kubernetes. Um, what these give you is visibility of all administrative actions taken within an environment. Any API call that's made uh, gets logged there, right? So we can track uh, creation, modification, deletion of resources. Um, we can track access in some cases. Um, we've got essentially all the visibility we could want of everything that's happening at the control plane layer coming out of that one data source. So that really is critical. If you only get one data source turned on in your environment, that's the one to pick. Um, then for service specific logs, um, essentially what these are, are logs generated by your S3 buckets, by your Lambda functions, by your KMS key access, um, Cases where the, the cloud native services, the, the past things you're using, are generating their own logs. And those, those tend to be very high fidelity. Uh, if you analyze them right, they also tend to generate a lot of data. And um, so typically we find clients benefit from turning these on on a case by case basis. So you might have an S3 bucket that's full of really important information. Having access logs for that is probably worthwhile. Equally, if you've got an S3 bucket set up to just serve out um, static content for a website, for instance, you probably don't need the logs for that so much, right? So 
it's about turning these on case by case, working out what you need them for, uh, and then enabling them accordingly, rather than just blanket drowning your analysts in data from them, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So when we're kind of well equipped and we know what it is we should be logging, we're going to know what the data sources are. The question then comes in terms of what is it that we're looking for then? And, and that comes down to the threat intelligence problem when it comes to cloud. So if we just look here, left and right, we've got the, the MITRE ATT&CK um, matrix there. Um, and on the left, you can see the on-premise version of that. And on the right, you can see um, the, the cloud equivalent there. And I think it's, it's obvious um, that the on-premise version is far more populated with, with, with the techniques across the kill chain um, than the cloud one is. And I think there's obvious reasons for that. The first, of course, is that, is that the on-prem version has been around for much longer. Um, but the way that this, this matrix ultimately gets populated is, is through threat intel, it, through reports, um, findings there of, of malicious activity that have been found. Um, and that's what ultimately it makes its way into this. And that's how we know kind of what to look for. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg in terms of we need to know what to look for. So we rely on attack for that kind of visibility. But then attack itself relies on us providing those reports um, to, to kind of fulfill it in, in terms of its potential. So there's a lot there that, you know, we, we need to know what to look for, right? So what is an attacker likely to do? Well, for us, the most obvious place for us to kind of rely on to find that information is in the environments that we exploit as part of our consultancy work. Um, and I think probably it's fair to say they can be distilled into one of these kind of four categories. And the first is identity management or mismanagement um, uh, and using our ability to kind of exploit those misconfigurations that allow us to elevate privileges and ultimately take control of cloud environments. The second is pivoting from other environments. So that could be starting off on premise, um, that could be through some other um, kind of internet facing asset, obtaining some level of access, escalating to the point where we can put ourselves in the relevant groups, potentially if there's some kind of single sign on, to ultimately arrive at the cloud environment with administrative privilege. Um, the third is, is um, source code management and continuous delivery, um, which we'll cover off in a second. And then the last is application vulnerability. So we're gonna take a little, a little look into that, that source code management one now. So when we talk about source code management and continuous delivery here, and um, really what we're talking about is an attacker targeting either the code repositories where your application code or your infrastructure's code is stored, or the delivery pipelines um, that take what's in those repositories and either build the relevant cloud resources or deploy the right application containers in the right places. And in many respects, this is sort of uh, tier zero for your cloud security. Everyone always thinks about hardening down what's in the cloud. Um, and we've seen quite a few cases where uh, people don't apply the same diligence to the supporting systems, especially from a, from a detection standpoint, um, you know, being able to track who's doing what to your pipelines into your source code actually is pretty important now that these are core components of the security of your entire platform. If an attacker compromises either the pipelines or the source code delivery, they can take control of basically everything, right? Um, you know, we can, we can deploy pretty much anything we want into the cloud from there, um, especially when we often find that the roles that those pipelines are running as, the access they have, um, is very privileged, perhaps often more so than it needs to be. So I think that's quite a, a key thing to factor in, really. Um, it's one that we, we exploit regularly ourselves on consultancy engagements, um, and I think it's a matter of time before we start hearing about attackers doing that, um, you know, if we're not already. So we've covered off then the telemetry sources, so, you know, what are we going to use for our detections? And we're taking a look at some of the attacks that we've seen um, over the kind of kind of four key areas there. So how do we start then? How do we action this? How do we build the effective attack detection? And I think the, the methodology that we've employed over the past year um, is kind of summed up with, with this model here. So the first thing that we're going to do is, is threat model the environment, understand she could be targeted. What would the attack paths look like hypothet hypothetically going from initial compromise right through to achieving some objective? And what that objective is, is again defined by the, the, the specifics of your environment. If you're hosting some, some sensitive data there, then likely is that that's going to be um, the objective for those attack paths. That's going to be the end goal. So once you've defined what those attack paths can look like, we need to prioritize. We need to say which of these have the highest impact, which of them potentially is going to get the, the attacker from A to B in the most expedient way. If there's an obvious path, an obvious exposure, um, then that's the kind of path that we need to be paying most attention to. And then we need to understand the like atomic attacker actions that comprise those those end to end attacks. So the TTPs, the tactics, the techniques, the procedures. What is an attacker going to do step by step 
to achieve this objective. And then the most obvious step is verifying that, that our, us as defenders have the telemetry we need um, to, to spot those things. So if we have a given attack type against a given service, we can take a look at that and say, do we have the service specific logs? Do we have the Cloud Trail API commands that, that relate to that? And in which case we're probably in a good place to start step five, which is actually executing those attacker actions and understand end to end if we have the detection cases that work or even as like a step zero, understanding what they might look like. So we can say, OK, this is the specific API events um, that we, we can look for. We can start building detections and fine tuning those um, to ultimately detect them should we replay those attacks at a later date. So I think one of the key messages that we've learned um, working with a combination of the sort of the operational teams in some of these uh, these environments, but also from the perspective of detection, one of the most powerful things you can do as a detection team in general, not just in the cloud, but especially in the cloud space, um, is move towards detection as code, basically, and um, define your detections in a machine readable format, something that you can easily version control, um, that you can update over time. Um, it provides an easy means to share knowledge within the team. If it's a common format that everyone can read, um, then rather than just talking about particular attacker activity at a high level and, and how it works and explain these things um, to your more junior analysts, they can go in and read the detections and really understand um, you know, exactly what this, this particular technique is going to do under the hood. Um, and we've seen a few key projects in the open source space around that um, already, um, not least Sigma, um, which is an a seam agnostic set of rules um, that you can compile down then to Splunk or QRUN as you're running. Um, we've also seen some interesting efforts with um, Jupyter Notebooks um, to, to build out a set of playbooks that you can run to hunt for specific attacker activity. Um, so we took all of this um, and over the course of the, the last year or so, we've been working on um, moving a lot of this stuff into the cloud. At which point we ended up with Leonidas, which is an open source tool we've we've released. Um, so essentially, the idea with Leonidas is that you have your security team, your analysts, the, the purple team as red teamers, who are executing these test cases as well, um, and they define themselves a new TTP that's committed into a into a repository. Um, we then have a CI/CD pipeline that actually builds out a serverless function based on those um, definitions. Uh, we then expose that serverless function to, to the Purple team and they can use that to execute attacks. So you make a single web request um, to execute a particular attacker TTP. Um, that's executed against whatever target resources you've got set up. And we then feed those logs uh, straight into the, the scene and you can then have your analysts hunt for the activity that uh, we just executed um, via this API that, that we've exposed. So I think the, one of the most critical things to it is that um, it's a fairly easy format to work with. The definitions are quite short and sweet. Um, the underlying framework takes care of basically everything about how the, the API itself functions, um, including how different identities within the cloud are handled. You know, for AWS, you can hand it roles to assume, you can hand it um, access keys and secret access key pairs. Um, and all the analyst has to do is write a single or to a Python to say, essentially call this Boto3 function for AWS or the Azure APIs for, for Azure. Um, and so we, uh, we then generate that into uh, an API uh, that runs inside that serverless function. These definitions also then contain um, detection cases. So we write the Sigma rules into the same place that we, we write the detection so that you've got a single file that defines um, exactly how to execute the attack, uh, exactly how to detect it, and that lives as a single source of truth for this attacker TTP that we, we have here. And we can take this definition and we can compile it down to, to work with the same platform that we're, we're using. Um, we can also generate documentation of it. So one of the really powerful things we found with this is it's an opportunity to embed uh, human context and notes about your organization, specific environments within your organization, to say things like, this probably is usually malicious, but in the case of these two particular projects, their AWS accounts do this all the time for business reasons, X, Y, and Z. So therefore, factor that in when you're triaging these events. Um, and that's that's proven pretty useful too. So um, let's, let's demo it. So this is Leonidas. This is the web API that we expose that uh, allows you to execute those test cases that I've just been talking about. And this is built by a 
AWS native CI/CD pipeline for Azure and GCP. We're building out using their native tooling as well. Right now, this is hosted in a Lambda function with an API gateway in front of it. Um, and you can see here, we've got a range of different test cases across the MITRE kill chain. So uh, let's dig into to one of them as an example. Um, perhaps we have some IAM access and we have a user that we've created as a, as a backdoor. Um, so let's add a policy to, to that user. And um, you can see here, not only can we pass in the, the user and the policy that we're, we're trying to target here, but also actually we can pass in a variety of identity-based data to allow Leonidas to execute uh, the test case as something other than itself. Um, it comes with an IAM role uh, and the permissions for that IAM role are automatically generated by the build scripts, but it's beneficial to be able to trigger test cases as a range of different identities. So in the case of AWS, uh, we can also pass in an ARM uh, to, for a role that we wish to assume, or we can pass in an access key, secret access key, key pair. Uh, we can also specify, obviously, the, the region that we're trying to target. Now, this interface is quite nice for exploring the API, but for security reasons, in order to trigger any of these test cases, you need to supply an API parameter, API key parameter, sorry, alongside it um, in order to, to get that executing properly. So you can either use Leo, which is a command line tool that runs uh, encapsulates these APIs and you run it locally and it speaks to um, to the Leonidas API but actually we've had quite a lot of success uh, working with Jupyter so Jupyter for those who aren't familiar is uh, essentially a, a web-based interface to a Python interpreter um, that allows you to embed code in and amongst documents uh, or document content um, and generate graphs and tables and all of these kinds of things. It's a pretty popular data science tool, but we've also found it very effective um, in the detection and purple teaming space. So here what we're doing is, uh, you know, we've got this Leonidas API endpoint. It's the same one we were looking at previously. Um, and so we're going to load in the set of test cases uh, from this case config. And the Leonidas framework will also generate this, this YAML file for you that defines all the test cases. But you can see here, we've got all the test cases uh, then loaded in uh, into this Jupyter Notebook. Um, so for instance, um, we were looking at the um, adding policy to a user one before. You can see that here in row number 35. Um, so we'll make use of that in a bit. But then to start actually triggering some test cases, uh, you can see here we're calling run case. There's a simple wrapper function around that, um, that HTTP API. Uh, and we're going to call get caller identity, which uh, you run to tell you who you are, what the identity of the, the current user or entity is. And so here you can see um, Leonidas has assumed a role. Um, it's this Leonidas dev app role. And so that's the, the default IAM role that the Lambda function has assigned to it when it executes to allow it to interact with the AWS APIs themselves. So let's assume now that we are an attacker. We have a vulnerability in this Lambda function that has allowed us to gain some sort of code execution or command injection or something. And so we're now um, executing these uh, attacker actions against the underlying AWS account. So first off, let's uh, enumerate these guard duty detectors that might be listening to us. Um, so in this case, we can see guard duty uh, is running. We've got detector ID here. So if we try and do anything too obvious, guard duty might spot us. Um, but also let's take a look at whether they've got any cloud trails in the current region. So here we can see we've actually got two cloud trails listening to us. So if the um, defenders are paying attention, we probably will get spotted, but we're going to carry on anyway. Um, what we're gonna try and do now is uh, add an IAM user. Uh, the Leonidas function uh, IAM role comes with a certain set of permissions defined in the test cases to allow it to always execute these, uh, these particular test cases that it's built with. Um, so we know this is gonna succeed. Obviously, if you've got permissions, boundaries, or other things configured, it might not. But for the sake of this exercise, um, you know, we're going to create a new user. Um, so we've got this new user created. Um, we passed in here into uh, into that API call. Um, and we're now going to add a, an API key to that user to make sure that we can interact with AWS as that user. Uh, for good measure, we're also going to add on the administrator access manage policy. Obviously, pretty bad practice, but it makes the rest of the demo work quite nicely. So we've now done that. Um, and what we can now start doing is running other test cases using those access keys that we generated previously that are, are in our Jupyter notebook. So I'm going to rerun that get caller identity test case, but you can see now we're actually passing in this, uh, this set of credentials that we've defined here. Um, and so if we run that now, you'll see that when we come back uh, from the, the caller identity call, we're now 
uh, running as a user account, in fact the user account we just created. Um, so we've changed the entity that we're executing these test cases as um, and this allows us to simulate a variety of different um, sort of attacker start points, um, assume different types of breaches, these kinds of things. So then what we can do from here, we can list the secrets in Secrets Manager. Um, you know, we're now an attacker who's poking around uh, trying to find uh, secret data or um, steal further uh, access keys credentials to get further into the environment. Um, and it turns out we've got a secret, it's called Leonidas Created Secrets. So what we're gonna do is uh, grab the contents of that um, with another Leonidas test case. And you can see here, we've got some, some secret data coming back from the, um, AWS APIs there. So what we've done is we've executed an entire kill chain. Um, we've simulated an application vulnerability inside the Lambda function as a start point. We've done some enumeration to see uh, who we are, what uh, defenses are likely to be watching for us. Um, we've created a persistence mechanism by creating an IAM user, adding an API key to it, um, adding some IAM permissions to that uh, user that we've just created. And then we've used that new user to enumerate the contents of Secrets Manager and dump some secrets out. And we've done all of that in a programmatic fashion um, in a way that doesn't rely on the analysts having an underlying understanding of what these test cases are, how the AWS APIs work. Um, we're simply triggering the test cases and the individual TTPs one by one as part of this larger kill chain. Now, one of the benefits to Leonidas is not only do we have the ability to trigger these test cases automatically, it also generates its own logs so you can compare and contrast them with what you're seeing in your seam and what alerts you've got firing. So let's jump into the, the latest set of logs here. And um, so what we'll find is, yeah, looking at the top, you can see we've got an STS get caller identity call um, followed by list guard duty detectors, uh, enumerate cloud trails for a given region. These are, are all the test cases. Um, you can see here that the arguments we're passing in are also represented so we can track uh, exactly how the test cases were executed, what parameters were passed in. Um, and if we go down to where we then run the second caller identity, you can see also that the access key ID that we passed in is recorded uh, and we have that on record so that we can understand what uh, entity these, these test cases will run as. We can feed all this data into a centralized logging platform or leave it in CloudWatch, in fact, if you prefer. Uh, but we can diff this then against what we're seeing in the seam and it allows us to get a better understanding of whether our test cases worked or not. Um, and we have those logs there for posterity. Uh, it doesn't require the analysts to take detailed notes as they go because everything they do is recorded automatically for you. Okay, so one of the other really powerful things then is off the back of that, we've got Leonidas running, we can execute these test cases, we can look at the, the logs in our seam, but actually Leonidas itself also produces its own set of logs as to what attacker actions were executed, um, you know, what parameters, what context, what resources they targeted. Um, and we can actually feed all of that somewhere as well into your seam or to another platform. Um, and we can then essentially diff the use cases that were triggered in Leonidas against the uh, events in the seam. And we can see whether the detections that we were expecting to, to trigger, um, you know, either as alerts or as tags or whatever else, um, whether those happen in the correct way. And that means that over time, actually, we can regression test improvements to our detective capability, right? We can add additional test cases, uh, additional use cases even. We can then verify that doing so hasn't broken any others. We can update uh, test cases to, to match new changes by the cloud providers, catch additional things. Uh, we can verify that we've not backslid in the process. And actually that means then we can iterate much faster because we're confident in our ability to catch mistakes as we go. Yeah, absolutely. So conclusions then. Well, it might sound corny, but I guess the ultimate thing here is that detection is a journey, right? So your cloud environments are changing all the time. Um, that could be because you're implementing new features, you're changing the way you do that, you're changing the services that you utilize. So ultimately your detection has to change with it. Um, we can also think about context, think about how important that is. And not only is that a case of, you know, it might seem as though that's an issue for you, that's, that's to your disadvantage, you can actually use that to make more effective detections. If you know the behaviors of your environment inside out, any deviation from that could build a high fidelity alert. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, and then lastly, as we kind of discussed here, the, the, that threat intelligence problem, not knowing what bad looks like, what we should hunt for, the ability to codify and ultimately share the use cases that you build is gonna aid knowledge sharing and ultimately help all of us to, to, to build more effective crowd detection really. 
Um, and then we've, we've talked about that threat modeling process going end to end, identifying attack paths, identifying potential needs for new telemetry or to, to kind of decommission something we're not using anymore. That constant cycle is something we can use to make sure that we're always kind of the most equipped we can be to, to detect malicious activity in the cloud. And then lastly, um, you know, please do go have a go with Leonidas. Let me know what you think of it. Um, it's available up on GitHub, uh, fsecure lab slash Leonidas. Um, we currently support AWS. Azure and GCP are actually pretty close to being done. We're, we're getting pretty far with that now. Um, at the moment, we've got 45 test cases for AWS. You know, you saw some of the demo earlier. There's quite a few others too. Um, go have a play with it, see what you think, um, let me know. Uh, you know and equally, uh, those test cases are up there because they've what we've needed so far, but actually um, they're pretty easy to write. So please do contribute your own pull requests more than welcome. Awesome, yeah. And that's it from us, thank you.